Hello and welcome to the Corona for 3ds Max tutorial covering Corona's Triplanar Mapping node. We'll look at all of the features of the Corona Triplanar node and dive into some of the most common use cases. When it comes to texturing your geometry, Triplanar Mapping offers a viable alternative to UV unwrapping and depending on the situation can save you a lot of time and effort. A perfect example would be this model of a sculpture, where unwrapping would not only be a lot of effort but may produce visible seams. We might also use UV box mapping to solve this, which is quicker than UV unwrapping, but will also show seams and might visibly stretch. To get around these issues, we can use triplanar mapping, resulting in a marble material that wraps around naturally with no discernible artifacts. To see how triplanar mapping works, we can start with plugging a triplanar node into the diffuse channel of a corona material. If we turn on the interactive rendering, we can see that the model renders as solid red, and this is because we have no bitmap plugged into any of the triplanar node inputs, so it takes the default red from the x-axis input. This also shows us that the checkbox use x for all axes is still checked. This is turned on by default because in most cases the same bitmap is used for all inputs anyways, so this saves us the time of plugging each bitmap into all three inputs when only one would do. If we uncheck it, each axis gets its own input now, and we see how each input color is projected from its respective axis. If we look closely at where the colors meet, it's evident that they are being mixed, creating a smooth transition between them. This is controlled by the blend parameter, which hides seams that would otherwise be visible. Setting the blend to 0 makes perfectly sharp seams, whereas a value of 1 blends all inputs completely and mostly makes a blurry mess of the texture. With a default value of 0.5, the inputs are mixed nicely before stretching would be too visible, and without obvious blurriness at the seams. If we rotate the sculpture, we can see that the projection axes move with it. This is controlled by the mapping space we select, which by default is set to local space. This means the triplanar node uses the object's XYZ coordinates and the object's scale to determine the mapping. If we plug in a checker map and scale the sculpture, we can see that the texture is scaled along with it. If we change the mapping space to world space, the orientation and scale of the object is ignored and the mapping stays constant relative to our world. In most cases, world space would be most useful because this means that the material will work on all objects regardless of their scaling. Be careful of using world space on objects that move during animation though, because this will let the object move through the texture rather than the texture keeping still in reference to the object. Let's set up a basic marble material that is robust enough to work on any other object. To start, we need to consider the bitmap we'll be using as inputs. In this case we're using a set of four bitmaps, which are seamless to prevent tiling. Each bitmap needs to have its own triplanar node, so to make the material more user-friendly we can link all of the parameters, meaning that if we change the value in one triplanar node, it changes for all. To do this, right-click the triplanar node and select Show All Additional Parameters. Now we can link each parameter to a separate linear float node, and when this is done, shift, click and drag the triplanar node to copy four linked nodes, one for each of the bitmaps. Now we can connect each bitmap to a triplanar node and then to the material. Because the nodes are linked, we can set up the parameters in any one of these. After we've changed the mapping space to world and adjusted the scale, the material seems to look good. If we apply it to any other object, like a sphere or a teapot, it still behaves as expected. Another possible use case that really shows us the power of the triplanar node would be when quickly texturing complex landscapes, like in this example. We can see that a different color is projected by the triplanar node according to the gradient or the steepness of the surface. We can use this feature to create a smart material that applies a grass texture to the faces pointing up and a rocky texture to the faces pointing sideways. We can do this by either plugging the grass texture into the Z input and the rock texture into the X and Y inputs, or another method would be to use the triplanar node as a mask for a corona layered material. To set this up, we can plug a grass material into the base layer and plug a rock material into layer 1. Now we can use the triplanar node as a mask for the rocks by setting the triplanar node X and Y colors to white and the Z color to black, meaning the rock will only show on the faces with a steep gradient. 
What makes the triplanar node especially useful here is that even if the topology changes, the mapping still looks good and changes with it. Another use case is in quickly adding detail and imperfections to an existing material, which in this case already uses triplanar mapping. This model of an Eames elephant is very basic, so maybe it needs to look a little bit more worn to add some interest. There are many different ways of going about this, but the underlying principle is that we can use a seamless bitmap of, let's say, smudges to liven up the material. To quickly check the scaling of the smudges, we can plug the bitmap into a triplanar node and plug that right into the diffuse channel. With the scaling adjusted and the mapping space set up, we can add this bitmap to the reflection glossiness input because we're dealing with finger and handprint smudges, which only really affect the reflection of a material. So we can add the smudges to a composite node and blend this with the original gloss input. For some more grunge though, we can add a scratches map, this time layering our grunge map into the diffuse reflection and gloss channels of the material by using a composite node for each channel. We can adjust the scaling, rotation and bleeding freely in the triplanar node until everything looks just about right. Using this method we can keep adding layer upon layer of detail to the material and because we're using the triplanar mapping for the whole thing, we can now use this setup on any other object and get quick predictable results without having to copy over any UV map modifiers or such. As a final note, we can set up a material to use reference node mapping, which means that we can adjust the mapping of multiple objects all linked to one dummy object in the viewport. To set this up, we can link a dummy we created to each triplanar node in our material by setting them all to reference node mapping space. With all of them linked to one dummy, we can now adjust the scale, position and rotation of the mapping with this one object. We could even link different materials to the same dummy object altogether if we want to control their scale from one single object whenever that becomes necessary. Even though the triplanar node does make material setup look a little bit more complex, the reality is that it can save a lot of time once it's been set up and create some fascinating and parametric smart materials. We hope that you enjoyed this tutorial on the Corona triplanar node. For some more information, please see the Corona help desk, and you can find a link to that in the description below this video.